My name is Anne Marie Benitez, and I am the Senior Director of Government Relations at National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. And we work to ensure the right of reproductive health and justice for Latinas and their families through public education, community organizing, and policy advocacy. NRLRH focuses on three program areas, increasing access to abortion, eliminating reproductive health disparities, and advancing the rights of immigrant women and their families. Among these issue areas, National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health has strongly advocated for gender-inclusive policy agenda among coalition partners and within the halls of Congress and state legislators. We remain committed in supporting efforts to keep families together to ensure and increase protections for immigrant victims of gender-based violence to the and to end the atrocious practice of detaining asylum seekers and some of the most vulnerable immigrants, including women, pregnant women, children, and LGBTQ immigrants. We recognize that despite tremendous achievements in the movement for LGBTQ rights, LGBTQ undocumented immigrants continue to be trapped in a system that poses a unique threat to their health and well-being. We also recognize that every human being, regardless of race, class, sexual orientation, gender identity, and or gender expression, has a right to live with dignity. And so we are grateful, very grateful, to be joined today by leaders who are committed in ensuring that the voices of LGBTQ undocumented immigrants are not lost in efforts to advance equality. And here are the leaders that will be speaking and will be introduced in just a minute. We come to this space as allies, and we hope that together we can send a strong message to Congress. We thank you all for being here today. And one thing that I would like to note is that we will be living, we're live streaming on Facebook in a moment, if we haven't started yet. We are on, so you're, we're all on record, folks. Um, uh, so please tweet today using the hashtag EndDetention. Hashtag end detention and help share the important message that our speakers bring to all of us today. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Claudia Flores, who is a National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health Immigration Policy Analyst, and who help bring all of us together and organize this. So thank you, Claudia, for all your hard work, and I turn it over to you. Right, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are so excited to hear from each and every one of our panelists. Uh, we have a very diverse group here, um, and I hope that this briefing um, serves an educational purpose for those, uh, especially who are on Capitol Hill and are informing um, policies, priorities for your members. I hope that you take lots of notes and that you uh, take some of the materials. Uh, we are handing out several reports um, right at the table outside. Um, and then you also have um, some one-pagers um, at your seats. Um, so before I begin, I um, just want to introduce myself again. My name is Claudia Flores. I am the Immigration Policy Analyst for the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, I come to you um, as a woman of color, as someone that um, considers herself to be an ally to the LGBTQ immigration movement, uh, but also as someone to, who recognizes that um, this is a system that is becoming every day more and more privatized. Um, and that is at the expense of human suffering. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to be joined um, by um, our panelists today who will shed light into what are the multiple issues and also challenges that we're facing uh, from previous and current administration. Um, so before uh, I commence, I would like to show you a brief video um, that puts into perspective um, uh, what are some of the challenges in uh, eliminating the system um, that is filling the pockets of corporate America uh, while separating families and putting uh, millions of lives at risk. Um, so um, with that said, let me um, share a video here. Hopefully it, let me.
detention of migrants is a multi-billion dollar industry. One in which immigrants are traded like products. They are for sale to the highest bidder. Who benefits and who profits? Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, the GEO Group, and the Management and Training Corporation combined own over 200 facilities in the nation. With over 150,000 bed spaces for a total profit of close to $5 billion per year. Private prisons profit like a hotel. The more occupants that go in, the more money comes out. You just sell it like you're selling cars, or real estate, or hamburgers. Private prisons rely on anti-immigrant laws that guarantee them access to fresh inmates. Here's how they do it. The American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, is an extreme right-wing membership organization comprised of state legislators and powerful multinational corporations, including the Corrections Corporation of America. ALEC is the most active private prison lobbyist group, pushing for anti-immigrant laws like Arizona's SB 1070. Russell Pierce, like CCA, is an ALEC member, one with obscure ties to national white separatist neo-Nazi groups. During an ALEC meeting, CCA and Pierce crafted a model legislation that became, almost word for word, Arizona's SB 1070. Whether people are undocumented or not doesn't matter. As long as they fill the detention facilities for days, months, or even years. SB 1070 and their copycat laws sprouting up across the country represent the perfect money machine. Um, so as you can see from this video, um, it is a very profitable system. Um, and um, that is not to also mention that the government um, now contracts with um, many local jails and um, you know it seeks to expand um, the criminalization of, of, of immigrants at the state um, and also at the federal level. Um, before we get started with our panel, um, I do want to provide a brief overview of what has been um, the timeline. Um, uh, very recently uh, with the new administration, um, President uh, Donald Trump um, signed three executive orders um, one of them um, received a lot of national attention, um, and that was the one that was deemed to be a Muslim ban and is now being challenged in the courts. Um, the other two additional executive orders that I want to point you to, which are very critical for our work, are the first two that were signed on January 25th. Um, the first one is enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States. That is also known as the Interior Enforcement Order. Um, this executive order eliminated pretty much any priority um, in the apprehension and deportation of immigrants, uh, which is why, as you will see, uh, whether it is through media reports or through stories and in your communities, uh, we have seen more and more immigrants um, uh, without criminal convictions um, in deportation proceedings. Um, this is all to say that um, you know we as an organization, um, you know, we challenge the idea and, and this notion that there is a good versus bad immigrant. Uh, but we also recognize that it is completely unfair to separate people that have been in their communities for many years um, who have, you know, some of them who have children here, but also many of them who um, pose no threat to national security and are simply being detained and apprehended um, because it's, it's something that is profitable and it's something that um, hasn't been challenged um, enough. Um, and then the other order is the Border Security and Immigration Enforcement Improvements, known as the Border Enforcement Order. Um, this executive order received some attention mostly around the idea of a border wall. Um, however, we do know that um, you know, Congress has now appropriated funds. Um, while some of the requests that were made by the president uh, were not fully, um, fully taken by Congress, there were still significant um, uh, 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 um, money appropriated. Uh, to even uh, what they call uh, pedestrian barriers, uh, because one of the challenges that we're seeing on the border um, apparently is not cars coming through, but it's people. Um, and I think that's when you know when we be begin to think about what this looks in reality. That means that uh, women, children, and those seeking asylum um, are being pushed into more dangerous journeys as they as they uh, try to seek protection here in the U.S. Um, so um, based on the erroneous assumptions that. 
um, you know, immigrants uh, commit crimes and that you know, they're here to take people's jobs. Uh, we are really here to have an informative discussion in terms of what the system looks like, what are some of the obligations that the federal government has, not only based on the international community, but also based um, on the rights that even non-citizens have in this country. Um, and also, I would like to um, have, at the end of the panel, we will um, have a presentation um, by some of our folks who will talk about what are some of the congressional steps that they're taking to ensure that there's improved monitoring and oversight of detention facilities. Um, so with that, um, I would like to introduce our first panelist. Um, we have Sharita Gruber from the Center for American Progress. Um, Sharita is, and let me read you her awesome bio, because she is really awesome. Um, and Sharita is the Associate Director of the LGBT Research and Communications Project at American Progress. She comes from Center American Progress with extensive experience working in immigration advocacy, law, and policy, as well as experience providing direct service to immigration detainees, refugees, and asylum seekers. Prior to joining American Progress, Sharita worked as a program specialist for the Women's Refugee Commission. In that capacity, she worked in Congress and administrative agencies for increased protection for migrant populations, particularly women, families, and unaccompanied children. She has also worked as a law clerk for the American Bar Association Commission on Immigration, where she provided support to immigration detainees in removal proceedings, including LGBTQ asylum seekers, and filed complaints of detention conditions with the Department of Homeland Security. Most recently, she completed a fellowship with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, where she wrote and submitted refugee resettlement requests to save third countries and liaise with congressional offices on refugee resettlement cases. Um, Sharita has her JD from Georgia University Law Center, where she was a public interest law scholar and the writing program director for the Georgetown Journal on Poverty Law and Policy. And she also received the Refugees and Humanitarian Emergency Certificate from the Institute for the Study of International Migration. And she holds a BA in Political Science and Women's Studies from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, so with that said, um, welcome Sharita, and uh, please lead us on. Well, thank you so much to Claudia and the National Latina Institute for having this event for all of you uh, coming out here. I know there's a couple things going on in the world competing for attention, and so it does mean a lot to see so many people care so much about this really important issue. Um, Claudia asked me to set the stage a little bit to kind of explain the scope of what we're talking about. And so, for starters, the largest detention and supervised release program in the country is run by the Department of Homeland Security. It's not the Department of Justice. It's DHS and immigration. Uh, in the most recent budget, the omnibus bill, uh, ICE got $2.7 billion for detention. Uh, this is the most they've gotten in the past. Um, prior spending bills had included a directive from Congress that ICE had to maintain 34,000 beds a day which is horrific. There's no other area of criminal justice even where you would be okay with a mandate to jail X amount of people regardless of need. Uh, they got rid of that language. Um, however, that's enough money to maintain 39,324 beds. And who knows what's going to be in the next budget or how much more they're gonna get. Um, so who are they focusing on? They're focusing on folks in the interior who have been here, um, as well as the folks who are easy to pick up to fill beds. Um, so I'm sure you all heard of the trans woman who was apprehended at a courthouse in Texas trying to seek a protective order against her abuser. Um, that's who they're going after. Immigration Equality had a client who was a gay Russian asylum seeker, um, had a pending affirmative application for asylum. So, you know, he'd come here, applied, done everything right, uh, left the country to go on vacation, came back, and was detained for months because they had beds to fill and they needed somebody to put in, and that's only gonna get worse. Um, we did took a look at a report that was available outside on how the policies to focus on people um, who have any contact with law enforcement and uh, making more law enforcement officers immigration enforcement officers would impact LGBTQ folks. And it was really horrific to see what the impact of this is going to be on this community because LGBT people are imprisoned at three times the rate of the general population, three times the rate. A third of women in jails and prisons self-identify as lesbian or bisexual or queer. A third of all women. Um, 
And so when you have a policy of further enmeshing immigration enforcement with criminal justice enforcement, and we see in the criminal justice system so much bias and discrimination against LGBTQ folks, you're going to be funneling in more LGBTQ folks into immigration detention. And these are also the really vulnerable folks who have a heightened risk of being victims of crimes. Um, so for example, one in five reported hate crimes um, to the FBI were motivated by the victim's sexual orientation or gender identity, and the risk of hate violence is even higher for LGBTQ unauthorized people. The incidence of hate violence against unauthorized LGBTQ individuals rose from 6% of LGBTQ survivors of hate violence in 2014 to 17% in 2015. Reports of intimate partner violence involving an unauthorized LGBTQ immigrant uh, doubled from 2014 to 2015. Uh, so LGBTQ folks on the outside are in this really horrific situation where heightened uh, um, instance of being victims of violence, and if you go to law enforcement for help, you are also at risk of being detained and deported as a result. And the conditions in immigration detention are horrific. Since 2009, under the past administration, there had been some attempt to address this through a variety of standards, uh, mostly because the rate of people dying in immigration detention were so high. Uh, one of the most horrific instances was Victoria Areno, who died in 2007 of her HIV just not being treated. She was completely neglected by the facility until she died. Uh, as a result, they had a number of standards, including um, standards on you know, basic health care that has to be provided, uh, preventing sexual assault against individuals in detention, and restricting the use of solitary confinement, because again, this is not, they're, you're not supposed to be incarcerated, it's supposed to be a civil system only to hold people uh, while their cases are pending. Punishment is completely inappropriate here, and my colleagues are gonna talk about, you know, despite the standards that existed, there were still a lot of problems in enforcement. The New York Times revealed that they're planning on undoing all the standards that exist. And so, for example, new contracts with jails don't have requirements that they have to abide by existing standards. DHS dissolved the Office of Detention um, Policy, and so the office in DHS that's responsible for creating standards of care no longer exists. So you have a sense of how highly the current uh, administration values standards and will continue to implement them. Uh, thank you for that overview, Sharita. Um, and now I would like to introduce Victoria Rodriguez Roldan. Uh, Victoria is the director of both the Trans GNC and Disability Justice Projects at the National LGBTQ Task Force. Particular areas of expertise and focus are the intersections of issues affecting transgender people with disabilities and mental illness, anti-trans workplace discrimination, and gun violence prevention from a social justice lens. She has been on trans advocacy the entirety of her adult life, including advocacy in Puerto Rico and in Maine. She is the author of Valued Transgender Applicants and Employees, a Gold Standard Best Practices Guide for Employers, and frequently speaks on discrimination issues impacting the trans community. Victoria was named the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network's 2016 Ally of the Year Award and has been profiled in NBC News and Latina Magazine, among other outlets. Prior to joining the task force, Victoria worked as an Equal Opportunity Specialist for the U.S. Department of Labor Civil Rights Center. Victoria holds her BA in Psychology with honors from the University of Puerto Rico and a JD from the University of Maine School of Law. Uh, welcome, Victoria. Okay, now. Uh, so, in many ways, I a lot of the work I do uh, is precisely centered around, as the bio said, the intersection around disability and the LGBT community, and thus is one of the big subjects that I'm trying that we tie into our work with immigration, essentially to give an idea of why this is relevant when we apply the U.S. Trans Survey uh, that was performed in 2015, 28% uh, of trans people identified as having a disability of one sort of or other. This self-identifying 
not necessarily uh, which is an underreporting at that point. This is compared with 19% of the general population. When we expanded to needing assistance for various major issues in life, like getting errands done and so on, we're talking past the one-third mark, around 34, 35%. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we do not have a crossover of these statistics when we apply it to immigration detention and to law enforcement. What we do have in many ways is the knowledge that most of these disabilities are mental health or trauma related in big part because of treatment rate related to discrimination where from the 2011 survey we have a 90% statistic of uh, mistreatment, harassment, etc. around employment settings and likewise mistreatment within, with law enforcement and immigration. In detention, 40% of trans people who reported being in detention uh, in immigration detention were placed in solitary confinement at one point or another. When we go into people who have interacted with police at a broader level, mm -hmm. we are talking around mistreatment due to being trans if they knew that, if police knew that they were trans, uh, past the one-third mark at that point. So what we create is essentially a situation where we create a pipeline towards emotional distress, which is best manifested in a 40% suicide attempt rate in about 80% of trans people, over 80% have at some point or other reported suicidal ideations in their lifetimes. And this leads once in, in detention, a process that is further traumatizing that mm -hmm. for emotional disabilities, which are obviously not going to be met in the course of treatment, much like with HIV, as Sharita said, uh, for example, access to medications that are needed and so forth. At that point, mm -hmm. when we consider the effects of, uh, of segregation, of administrative segregation, which is the mm -hmm. night for describing uh, solitary confinement, we start essentially going down a situation that worsens the possibilities and outcomes of any immigration process. Uh, we, any possibility as far as uh, getting a legal status, for example, starts becoming more difficult if the person has been traumatized out of wanting to deal with government in general, with officials and so on, by outing themselves essentially this being especially true in asylum applications as well as in other types of uh, status applications. Thus, essentially, and finally, around uh, the course of proceedings, one thing to keep in mind is that in immigration court, you don't have a right to counsel, much like in civil and other situations in civil court. That means that if you don't comprehend what is going on and you did not were unable to access an attorney, good luck essentially. And much like courts have been trying, immigration courts have been trying to say at times that small children are capable of understanding the proceedings enough, uh, they are not going to meet their Section 508 uh, requirements. Mm. Section 508 of the Re Rehabilitation Act and 504 are what require uh, the, very, the federal government to meet its accommodation mm -hmm. standards when it comes to dealing with people with disabilities. In immigration mm -hmm. detention, in immigration court, this means being able to provide the accommodations necessary to ensure that the person is understanding what is going on, to ensure that the person is getting whatever treatment needs to be happening, and so forth. And obviously, this also entails, in our opinion, access to counsel and whatnot if the person is in, the pro in a process of immigration removal proceedings where fit losing the case essentially means death, essentially. I am going to stop uh, the ramble at this point, uh, but essentially, 
that is the major intersection and one major problem where I will essentially indict a little bit of the community is that we are often failing to both disability attorneys and disability advocates often are not necessarily understanding fully of immigration law and thus we are one of our pieces of work is trying to strength strengthen that work between disability advocates who understand the obligations around 508 best as well as those who understand immigration law and so forth so that is essentially our continuing work in a tiny little part of the mess of papers that usually occupies my desk, among other things. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for that, um, Victoria. Um, and now I would like to welcome Christina Fialgo. Uh, Christina is the co-founder and executive director of Community Initiatives for Visiting Immigrants in Confinement, otherwise known as CIVIC. She's an attorney, a 2012 Echoing Green Fellow, a 2016 Ashoka Fellow, and currently a social entrepreneur in residence at UC San Diego's Ready School of Management. Civic is a national nonprofit that is working to end the U.S. immigration detention system. Civic currently visits and monitors 43 of the largest immigration detention facilities on a weekly basis through a network of volunteers. Um, you can also learn more about Civic at andisolation.org. And if I may add, I must say that I've known Christina for many years. Um, she and I hail from the same alma mater, and I was actually her first intern. So I'm really thrilled to have her now as a colleague. And um, with that, welcome, Christina. So I want to start off with sharing a story. Uh, Latoya Ricketts is a transgender woman who was detained at the Santa Ana City Jail in the summer of 2016. And she had just visited with her attorney and was being escorted back to her jail cell by a corrections officer at this facility. Thank you. Um, she was being escorted back to her jail cell by this corrections officer who was a male. She's a transgender woman. And this corrections officer told her to go into the men's restroom. And inside the men's restroom, the corrections officer told her that he was going to have to perform a strip search. And what he did is he said that she needed to take off her clothes slowly and lustfully. And Latoya was humiliated. This happened six months after Civic filed a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, at DHS that was on behalf of 31 transgender and cisgender women who were victims of routine, unlawful, and degrading strip searches at this exact facility. But our complaint had gone uninvestigated, like so many complaints, and therefore sexual assault continued at this facility. So as Claudia mentioned, Civic, or Community Initiatives for Visiting Immigrants in Confinement, is a national nonprofit, and we're working to end the U.S. immigration detention system. We visit and monitor 43 of the largest immigration detention facilities in the country through a network of volunteer-run visitation programs. We also run a national hotline that allows people to call us at no cost to them. And through these two windows into the immigration detention system, we're able to track human and civil rights violations such as medical abuse and sexual assault. So in early 2016, we began to see an increase in the number of complaints being lodged with us about sexual assault from both transgender immigrants as well as cisgender immigrants in detention. And we decided to see if the government's data was reflecting the same increase. So we filed Freedom of Information Act requests with three agencies within the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, OIG, which is the Office of the Inspector General, and the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. We gave ICE and the Civil Rights Division nearly a year to respond to our FOIA requests. We followed up with them on a monthly, sometimes weekly basis, and they chose not to comply with the Freedom of Information Act. The Office of the Inspector General, they responded within um, a prompt time, and the data that they provided us was extremely disturbing. What we learned is that between January 2010 in July 2016, there were over 33,000 complaints of sexual assault or physical abuse being lodged with the Office of the Inspector General against DHS component agencies. 
and ICE had the largest number of complaints. There were 44% of the complaints were against ICE, which is about 15,000 complaints. And CBP, Customs and Border Protection, which also runs immigration detention facilities at ports of entry, they received 10,000 of the complaints. Now, out of over these 33,000 complaints, OIG investigated less than 1% of these complaints. They investigated only 247 mm -hmm. complaints. So this is extremely disturbing because immigrants who have been sexually assaulted in immigration detention are re-victimized by an ineffective or non-existent investigation process. And by not properly investigating sexual assault, our government and all of us are sending a message that sexual assault of immigrants will be tolerated. And this is wrong. So sexual assaults are being perpetrated by ICE officers, by contracted facility guards, and even by medical professionals. So one woman that we interviewed, Roslana Santos, she was detained at the York County Jail in Pennsylvania. And she was being escorted back from an immigration hearing to her jail cell. And another male officer at this facility told her that she needed to go into this other room. This room had no cameras. And he told her that she needed to do everything he said or else he would sodomize her. So she was brave and she filed a complaint. Most people do not file complaints. Only 18% of the people who tell us about sexual assault actually go forward in submitting a complaint to the government. So Rosanna filed a complaint, but instead of investigating the complaint and addressing the issue at hand, they threw Rosanna into solitary confinement for 11 days. Um, there's other really disturbing cases. So for example, at the Northwest Detention Center, which is a privately run immigration detention facility by GEO Group in Washington State, a man filed a complaint about sexual assault during a medical examination by Immigration Health Service Corps, which is a branch of the government that oversees healthcare and actually uh, provides healthcare at this facility. Um, and this isn't just happening to adults, this is happening to children. So at the Carnes Detention Facility in Texas, which is a privately run detention facility, there um, was a young girl under 18. She was there with her mother because this is a family immigration detention facility, and she was sexually assaulted. And she filed a complaint. Um, she was provided with a medical examination. The medical examination found vaginal scarring and an STD, but ICE and DHS deemed the complaint unfounded. And many of the complaints and the individuals that we spoke to, um, like a gentleman, Douglas Menhivar, who was raped in immigration detention in Texas, his complaint was not addressed till three years later. Um, he wasn't given a rape kit, so there was no evidence, and the witnesses to the rape had already been deported by the time he was, his case was investigated. So of course, DHS found that his complaint was unsubstantiated as well. So I'm here today because I want to ask Congress to do two things. So one, we want Congress hopefully to create the second bipartisan National Prison Rape Elimination Commission. The first bipartisan Prison Rape Elimination Commission actually put out a report in 2009 that found a large and growing number of detained immigrants are at risk of sexual abuse. The second thing that we want to see happen is for DHS to publish sexual assault complaints and investigations mm -hmm. on a quarterly basis. The Freedom of Information Act exists for a reason, so that the public can know what's happening mm -hmm. behind closed doors with mm -hmm. our tax dollars. But DHS consistently undermines the integrity of FOIA, and we need to know what's happening um, with regards particularly to sexual assault. Um, and so after this congressional briefing, Congressman Grijalva's office will be following up with congressional offices with a sign-on letter, really asking for these couple things and really highlighting mm -hmm. the problems of sexual assault and immigration detention. Um, I want to leave with just a quick note about why I got involved in this work. So I got involved in this work because I could no longer bear to see mothers being ripped away from their children. I could no longer bear to see communities being torn apart. And I come from three generations of immigrants. My great-grandfather came here through the Azorian Refugee Act, and my grandparents and my dad followed. 
And Congress in 1958 created the Azorian Refugee Act, and that not only affected my great-grandfather, that affected generations to come. So what Congress does today, and what we all do together today, not only affects people in immigration detention and their families right now, it's gonna affect generations to come. So I hope you'll join me in working to abolish sexual assault in immigration detention. Thank you. Thank you. And aren't we lucky that Congress did that act years ago so that we could have Christina speak in today. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so now we have Jamila, and I'm really excited to introduce uh, Jamila Hamami, who is uh, actually took the train from New York, so we have her for a few hours. Uh, but um, Jamila is a queer first-generation Tunisian Muslim Arab American DNC woman of color, community organizer, and social worker from the South, now based in New York City. Um, she, they are the founding executive director of the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project. She is a graduate of the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College with a degree in community organizing social work with a specialization in immigrants and refugees. They come to this work with a personal and familiar experience with the incarceration and immigration system, a background in reproductive justice, working to center women of color's voices in the movements, and witnessing the impacts of migration and racism in her formative years in Texas. Jamila is a survivor of police brutality and the carceral system, mm -hmm. but is fortunate to have been able to remain in the free world based on civil rights violations. She's also a leader of the New York City chapter of Black and Pink, an organization run and led by those that are currently or previously incarcerated in free world allies. Um, welcome, Jamila. Thank you. So I want to start off with a very brief story, and many people on this panel actually worked on this campaign, um, but I want to discuss Meta Chui. Um, Meta Chui is a transgender woman that was detained in Arizona many years ago. Um, she was detained and dealt with sexual violence, but her story, while similar to many of the other ones, um, is something that we often like to think don't actually happen. She made it very, very clear to the officers that were inside of her um, actual unit that the person that she was in the cell with had threatened sexual violence against her. Unfortunately, the guards didn't do anything, and instead she was sexually assaulted. Um, whenever she came forward with the situation to the guards and made it very clear to them that she had experienced sexual assault from her cellmate, they threw her in solitary confinement and tried to have her sign on to a document saying that it was consensual sex. So her story isn't that uncommon, unfortunately, um, in immigration detention. And we like to think that in the, I guess, typical prison system, it's a little bit different. But the fact that Priya still really isn't doing much for folks that are currently incarcerated in immigration detention is very telling, right? Um, we're not holding immigration to the same standards as we're holding the rest of those that are caught up in the justice system. So I just feel like when we talk about these situations, there are people like Meta Chui that have dealt with incarceration who are actually back in the incarceration system again that have to deal with these sorts of things. And for her, she's gonna have to deal with the immigration system once she's released from prison. Um, I just want to kind of do a review of 2016 of how QDEP has operated. So QDEP, um, the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, is a community organizing, direct service, advocacy, um, and detention visitation program located in New York City. We provide most of our direct service to folks that are actually in the New York and New Jersey area, but we have um, a hotline and we're also a part of a pen pal program that's reaches all over the United States. So for us, we provide support to folks that are all over that might need legal representation and assistance obtaining that, um, but more locally, we provide direct wraparound services, we help raise bonds, those sorts of things for folks. Um, in 2016, we served 62 folks um, all over the country with complete services, so that includes helping raise bonds for some of those folks, um, clearing them up with legal representation, that sort of a thing. Um, but when you go kind of inward to where we actually provide most of our services at, like visitation, we provide most of our services in New York and New Jersey. So Elizabeth Detention Center is the primary facility that we work within. Within that facility, there is it's supposed to specifically be an all men's facility, but it actually holds a lot of transgender women. So we often come into contact with transgender women through this facility as well as Hudson, which is also in New Jersey. Um, out of the women that have come to us in the last year of 2016, um, out of the 10, seven of them had told us they had been sexually assaulted in some sort of, some, sorry, some form of way. So whether that was 
um, being groped by guards, groped by their peers, um, put in corners and done similar things that Christina was describing of having to strip. Our folks have come to us and told us that those things occurred. Unfortunately, they came after they were released and they didn't want to make waves while they were incarcerated, so they didn't report any of these things. This isn't uncommon, right? Um, I think the other things that are important that we don't often talk about are lesbian mothers that are caught up in the system. We actually work with a lot of lesbian mothers through Berks, which is a family facility that um, was in Pennsylvania. There's also facilities in Texas that are family facilities as well. Um, but we have multiple lesbian moms that come to us and say that they've dealt with sexual violence but choose to not report it out of fear of retaliation to their children um, or to themselves with deportation. Um, of Every 500 folks, um, one person is trans in facilities across the country, and one in five are survivors of sexual assault, right? So it's really huge and devastating numbers that I think that we should all think about. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of studies on what's happening with queer women, bisexual women, and lesbian women as well. Um, hopefully that information is something that we can collect over time. But at this moment, transgender women are definitely under attack and are experiencing the most violence in our communities. In terms of folks actually getting out of detention, we often talk about different policies so that when people are inside of detention, conditions are better. But I think we need to be thinking more about what it looks like for folks to not even be incarcerated at all. But for folks to actually get out of detention, we have Im immense issues around people actually getting legal representation, with only 14% of people that are in detention have legal representation, and only 3% um, have a chance of winning um, asylum at all. So I think that if we think about those numbers, we are in a bad situation, especially if we're talking about legal representation and, and the things around bonds. So a lot of our folks have bonds that are put on them. Um, Laura versus Shanahan in 2015 um, held that non-citizens can be you know, cannot be subjected to prolonged detention, so they have to have a bond hearing within six months. Unfortunately, the floor of a bond um, is about $1,500, but they're reaching up to $100,000 and more. Um, the highest bond that we've had on anyone was $20,000. Uh, we're currently awaiting um, to kind of find out what's going to happen um, around the ACLU because they came for the ACLU Foundation of Southern California has a class action suit they put forward in November 2016 um, saying that uh, we're unable to, uh, that the United States government, um, I lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. <laughs> The sign came up and I lost my train of thought. It's fine. So QDEP has a trans and queer migrant freedom fund that we're trying to raise funds for folks so that we don't have to worry about how we're going to get those folks out of detention, right? So I think that the largest issue that we have to think about at this point is what does it look like for folks whenever they're currently detained, especially when we have presidential executive orders like went forward in January and February that are making it pretty clear that they're trying to get folks out of the country, that we have southern states as well that are trying to make law enforcement into immigration and customs enforcement officers whenever it's very clear that they discriminate amongst the LGBTQI community. And I think that my largest ask out of all of these things, um, which is quite a lot of content on this panel, I recognize that, is um, that honestly that we reconsider the idea of detaining people at all, especially LGBTQI folks. I think that if we really think about what vulnerability looks like, and we talk about people being in vulnerable situations, and we need to recognize that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, across the board, all of these folks are incredibly vulnerable, and at this moment in time, and probably never, the Justice Department and immigration is never gonna be able to take care of these folks effectively. So we need to really consider not having them inside of detention at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamila. Um, and now, um, to conclude our panel, we have Isa Noyola. Um, Isa Noyola is a trans-Latina activist, a national leader in LGBTQ immigrant rights, um, immigrant rights movement, excuse me, and the director of programs at Transgender Law Center, a national organization that changes law, policy, and attitudes so that all people can live safely, authentically, and free from discrimination regardless of their gender identity or expression. She also works extensively for the release of transgender women from ICE detention and on untold deportations. Isa is passionate about abolishing oppressive systems that criminalize trans and queer immigrant communities of color. Um, welcome, Isa. We are five youth, ages 15 to 21, who, are su who suffered terrible persecution because of our gender identity. As transgender women, we have been forced to sex work and faced many risks and have been sexually assaulted, and our friends and family have been killed. 
We were about to cross the U.S. to ask for asylum, but we were, are afraid to be deported. At the border, we are suffering yet again. The shelter where we are experiencing a lack of respect for our gender identity, and one of us was a victim of a, a, an attempted sexual assault last night. We want the U.S. government to take the transphobia and homophobia out of their brain. We have hearts and souls. We also know how to fight for our rights. We need immigration status to be able to be safe and to work. We need refugee from the U.S. We are human beings, and we don't want to be disposed of or forgotten. This is from um, four trans women from Honduras, um, ages 15 to 21, Griselda, Allison, Kenzie, and Michelle, who all um, are at the Tijuana border right now. And um, I just got a text from them. Uh, I, I told them I was here right now. Um, they traveled on foot for a month through Mexico. Um, yeah, I spoke to them this weekend, and uh, the stories that they were telling me um, of just the, the violence that surrounded them on a daily basis while risking it all to leave their hometowns because of the violence from family members, from police, from the state, and from society at large. Um, and their quote and this sentiment is one that many trans Latinas, trans immigrant, gender nonconforming folks um, feel and face and live um, in terms of the overall violence that and context that they are experiencing. Um, and just to give you a little more of that context, from reported cases that exist globally that we know of, reported cases from October 1st of 2015 through September of 2016, um, 295 trans and gender nonconforming murders occurred, majority being from Latino America, uh, majority being from uh, Brazil and Mexico. Um, and these are just recorded, these are cases that are, you know, kind of picked up from the media and from the, the few agencies that exist to kind of um, share this information. Um, every year there's the Trans Day of Remembrance where we read off the names of all of these women, the majority women who have been murdered. And so I think it's really important to think about when we're talking about detention, when we're talking about state violence, when we're talking about the context of violence, it's really important to think about the global aspect and why, like what is at the root cause, what are the push factors that are, that are bringing our communities here? Um, and for trans folks, it is incredibly violent. Um, already here in this country alone, um, the lack of protections and the climate that trans and gender nonconforming folks are facing um, are seen through policies, anti-trans legislation throughout many states, um, not just Southern. Um, we were about to see a, 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 a referendum in California as well um, of, of really thinking about how to curtail and, and, and in, um, prevent access, um, public access for trans individuals. Um, I, I, I know that this is a lot and it is this heavy. Um, there's tons of information also um, at the table and I know you're gonna share some of the, the reports that have been brought by all of us. Um, I know, and all of, all of this information that we're sharing is really um, accessible on YouTube and Google, so. Um, and, you know, we're an email away as well. Um, because there, but the fact of the matter is eight minutes, um, even an hour is not enough to really dig deep into how, how deep this issue is. Um, and for advocates and for community organizers on the ground and for trans individuals who are fighting for their communities, they are in day in and day out um, really putting their, their best thinking and their efforts and their strategies and their resources together to think about how to raise money for bail, how to put together a campaign for liberation for one of their sisters, um, putting on drag shows so that they can raise money to uh, feed the community. Um, these are all strategies that are happening, not just in major urban hubs, but also in rural areas where we're seeing there's lack of support and infrastructure for trans individuals. Um, and so I definitely want to encourage all of you all to reach us out, to reach out to all of us who, who do have access and, and, and can 
sit down with you a little more in terms of giving you the, all that's been happening. Um, but one of the, I think, insightful things for you all to realize in this moment is that the conditions that folks are facing inside, it's not because of a lack of activism or, or like strategy or for nonprofits that have not prioritized this, even though there could be some more support. Um, there always could be more support. But, um, but it's really been a willi unwillingness from the Department of Homeland Security and ICE. I mean, it's been this antagonistic sort of like, oh, yeah, violence and sexual assault. Like, it's like this, even though they, they say, like, you know, I, I remember last year in um, the refugee, like International Refugee Day, they, they put out a quote to saying, you know, we are about creating safe, um, you know, and and accessible spaces, or or like it was just this quote that it was so, um, it was just it was ridiculous that they were messaging this kind of idea of safety inside detention for refugees, um, and their mm -hmm. commitment to that. Um, last year, we had a group of trans immigrant women who courageously came to D.C to advocate on behalf of themselves and the community. All of these women had been placed inside detention facility. And we had been granted access to this closed door, off the record meeting with DHS, with um, Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, um, Alejandro Mayorkas, and Serena Hoy, and a whole bunch of top officials, um, so that trans women can be recognized as a vulnerable population in a memo on writing and saying, like, we have to understand the context of violence. Um, and unfortunately that it didn't, you know, fast forward a couple months later, the election happened and it all kind of came crumbling down. So the political will um, needs to continue to happen. Um, and that's why I traveled all the way from California to be here and why a lot of my sisters and why um, I left the group of, of, of immigrant trans women um, to say that the political will, the muscle, the um, ability to understand what windows are open for conversation and for advocacy and for policy still need to happen, um, even through this time. Uh, we cannot give up. Uh, my community does not um, have the luxury of hope because hope has is, is been given up a long time ago. They're actually in survival mode and continuing to push through all of these violent contexts. So um, I, I encourage you all to reach out and, and hopefully we can continue this conversation offline as well. Um, thank you to all our panelists. Um, this was excellent. Um, I realize there's a lot of information um, and we are just at four, which is the time that we have for the briefing. Um, before I open up, I will uh, provide the opportunity for one or two questions, but I want to um, end this panel with, with this question and it's one that I hear from media, from advocates, from legislators, and even from people that are just interested in knowing more about immigration. Um, you know, despite the unique challenges that were faced during the previous administration, um, what do you see different, right, in terms of um, the immediate, um, and I know, Sharita, you alluded, for instance, to the fact that um, an office that is dedicated to detention policy and even to engagement from outside stakeholders is being eliminated without, within the agency. Um, that is, you know, in charge with, um, you know, we're pretty much leading these operations, right? Um, so if you could each speak to what are some of the immediate challenges facing your organization under this administration, um, and what is something that um, members of Congress um, can now do to at least inquire and, and promote more monitoring as, you know, as we keep fighting to eventually end the system. Um, but if you could speak to that, because um, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, questioning that comes, you know, President Obama deported a lot of people, the situation wasn't ideal, um, but what is something that you've seen change immediately, right, from this current administration? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, mean, I think all of us have been working together on this issue under the last administration, and it was hard to imagine things getting worse, and yet they have. Um, at least before DHS headquarters had some priorities about, you know, we weren't going to focus on detaining and deporting every single person that comes across our path. That has definitely changed. Uh, there has at least been some degree in the past from headquarters and some uh, a 
degree of accountability for the field offices and individual detention facilities to at least follow some basic standards of treatment of people, and that's gone as well. I mean, the field offices, ICE um, agents, CBP agents now feel free to basically do as they please, and they know that headquarters just, and this administration is not interested in reining them in, so honestly, it's on y'all, it's on your offices to be that accountability, because it's not gonna come from DHS headquarters. It's only Congress now. It's information, I mean, we're constantly asking for information so that we can provide legal access. We have uh, pro bono attorneys waiting to represent trans immigrant women, and even with complicated criminal cases, and ICE is refusing to grant us access and is being very antagonistic in terms of their messaging around where where are they? Where, and they know where they're at, they're at. And they're wanting to make it difficult for us to, to provide that legal access, even though they, in the past, said they've, they're committed to providing, to connecting legal um, access to folks who are um, for political asylum purposes. Um, about that, that's pretty much what I was gonna say as well. I feel like um, before we used to say that ICE was a rogue agency, and then I guess we just didn't realize what rogue looked like. Mm -hmm. Because I definitely have to say that at this time, like ICE really is just doing whatever they mm -hmm. want, and so are the police departments and their collaboration with immigration. Mm -hmm. They're just, it's like a free for all. And so I feel like it is up to you all. If at this point, like, I feel like as advocates, we've all pushed up and done as much as we can and we continue to, but we're not gonna make as much impact and change as we want as long as they think they can do whatever they want. Um, so I guess that's where you all come in. I'm just going to also point out since I already thought of DHS as the single most transient agency I had ever dealt with, and that was last year. Nowadays, we feel like we have no idea how good we had it. Uh, but what I'm going to say also is it's the hour to work more so than ever, and it was always that case with the grassroots activists, with the folks outside mm -hmm. of the Beltway bubble, which isn't even Beltway, it's a Northwest mm -hmm. DC and Montgomery County bubble in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and to expand that and to include those stories, and to work with the litigators that are also challenging this in court every single day and to help get that funding and empower those voices since there's a limit to what we can do right now with ICE and overall DHS, which is essentially just yell at them and it's like dealing with a brick wall at times. Yeah, I'll just add that I think we're at a unique moment, obviously, um, but I think more and more people at least are recognizing the term immigration detention, even if they don't understand what it actually means. And so I think we have an opportunity here to really start educating more people, to talking to our friends, talking to our family, talking to our colleagues about what you've heard today, um, and really pushing for, you know, we've talked about the problems within the immigration detention system in terms of conditions, but I really want to push um, and ensure that you all hear that I think we all on this um, table are pushing for an abolition of immigration detention, and we want to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I would like to open it for any questions that we have from the audience. Any questions? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, okay. yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. I'm from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, so I saw um, on the cap letter that there was um, a congressional bill that was introduced related to sanctuary cities. I know that across the country, cities and states are declaring themselves as sanctuary locations, which will definitely aid undocumented immigrant and refugee communities. Um, I'm wondering what else we can take in terms of state and local action, um, because I'm being real, I don't see Congress working too much on this for the next two years. Um, so in terms of where we all come from originally, in terms of where our states are, where our cities are, you know, in Los Angeles, where I'm from, um, Mayor Garcetti and City Council and the Board of Supervisors approved a $10 million fund for legal fees for immigrants in immigration court, um, and the same thing happened in Seattle. So I'm wondering in terms of local and state policy issues and solutions that we could be addressing um, for the whole government. 
Yeah, I would say so beyond the legal representation, I think it's really important to think about uh, on the local level and state level affirmative legislation for LGBT and in particular for trans folks so that legal process like gender, na name and gender change can be facilitated a lot more easier. Um, you know, birth access to birth certificates, uh, you know, trans inclusive healthcare, all that kind of stuff. So that really can happen on the local level. And I've been pushing, also doing internal advocacy with immigrant rights organizations as I was there thinking about sanctuary city policies to really think about trans affirmative policies that are included in their package that, are, that really understand gender in a more expansive way. And so I think that the sanctuary conversation needs to have, be more expansive to include um, the challenges of trans and immigrant, um, LGBT immigrant folks. Um, really quickly on, on this, um, a couple of things. So in New York City, um, Mayor de Blasio, which we're considered a sanctuary city, Mayor de Blasio uh, just announced $16 million um, that would be going towards immigration. Mm -hmm. um, work in general, but he's nixed it for anything related to detention or anyone with it, like in, any sort of criminal charge. So honestly, like this idea of sanctuary city, I just, I honestly want to say that it's nonsense. It's just complete nonsense. Like it's great that our people have much, they're making these decisions that we're under sanctuary, but as long as ICE can do whatever they want, we're really not a sanctuary city. Um, whether that's New York City, I don't really know much about LA. Um, I used to live in Seattle. It's quite questionable there, in my opinion, of Seattle's sanctuary city as well. But these sorts of things, I understand that it's supposed to be great and that we should be happy for it, but I think that we should really push back on that and really make them define what sanctuary means and how they're going to keep the federal government out. Like, honestly, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they're going to come in and do whatever they want, right? We've kind of talked about that. So, I mean, this thing with Mayor de Blasio and $16 million, it's great, but it's sort of irrelevant whenever most of the people in the LGBTQI community deal with the carceral system in some way form and fa or form or fashion because they're discriminated against for just existing, right? They're criminalized for just being there, so. Um, I think one thing too that we can do at the state level is work towards ending for-profit immigration detention. So I'm from Los Angeles as well, and in California, um, Civic, along with the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, are co-sponsors of a bill called the Dignity Not Detention Act um, that um, Senator Ricardo Lara has authored. It's SB 29. And basically what that law is going to do is it's going to end for-profit immigration detention contracting in the state of California. So we'll be the first state to do that. And second, it's going to require ICE's performance-based national detention standards that Sharita was talking about that's being kind of uh, nixed at the federal level is going to be codified into California law. So any immigration detention facilities in that state will have to abide by that. It's not, it's actually going to be enforceable. So I think other states can take those actions or at least we can lift up the work in California to the federal level to show that this is something that needs to be done at a federal level when there is that, that ability. Um, yeah, I think it's, you have to be really clear about what you mean when you're saying sanctuary, and you can't have a sanctuary city if you don't have police reform accompanying it, especially when we're talking about LGBT populations because of just the staggering level of criminalization of these communities. Um, also, like Christina said, there's a whole lot that can be done locally because ICE just doesn't have the ICE-owned bed space to detain all the people they want to. They're very reliant on county and local jails, which, hey, guess what? Aren't under federal jurisdiction. And so there's a whole lot that can be done at the local level to ensure that these facilities aren't renting bed space to ICE. Or in, if you can't get that far, at least having standards that those facilities have to abide by that um, and are monitored and a, stand, and a level of care that they have to provide that goes above and beyond these BS re requirements or lack of requirements entirely that we're seeing in current ICE contracts. Um, thank you, and we have time just for one last question and we'll have to close the program. Uh, well, I just had a quick question uh, after what Sharita said. So I heard that one of the problems with not allowing local communities to be used to uh, sort of detain some of these immigrants is that uh, ICE then just takes them further away and it just makes it much more difficult for families or for attorneys to get to them. So it's not like ICE is going to give up on it. It's not going to prevent ICE from doing it. It just creates more of a burden on the family and the attorneys. So is that, could somebody speak on that as well? Um, 
Yeah, I can speak a little to that. I mean, I think that our immigration detention system, we are going to see an increase in the number of people in immigration detention under the Trump administration. We've already seen that in terms of the, the budget. Um, I think whether people are detained in a city jail near a population center or out in the middle of the desert does have somewhat of an effect on representation. Um, but what we're seeing nationally is that still 84% of people in immigration detention, some places much higher, are not represented. And most of the times when people are picked up from their local community, even if there are detention facilities like Orange County in Southern California, there's three immigration detention facilities, but people who get picked up in Orange County are never detained there. They're detained somewhere else, so they're still gonna always be apart from their family. So we need to do what we can, listening to people in detention, of course, and taking um, you know, uh, their concerns into consideration and really listening to them and um, moving forward with what they want, but really trying to push back as much as we can on every immigration detention facility and holding them accountable. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions, so stick around and feel free to, I'm sure some of the panelists are able to stay maybe for a few minutes. Uh, please take the reports. Um, I know that there's several reports. Um, this one is the most recent one that Civic in partnership with Human Rights Watch has um, published, and that one has more information around medical neglect in facilities. Um, I just want to close uh, with a thank you to our panelists. Um, they were great, as you can tell. Um, they've been, you know, pushing their, uh, putting all their dedication into this, and I'm sure that um, they will be great resources for you, um, especially moving forward. Um, so thank you for coming today, and I hope that um, you will stay in touch. And, and lastly, I do have a representative here from Representative Grijalba's office, who is our honorary host of this briefing, and Jacinia could speak a little bit more to the sign-on letter that they've been circulated, which Christina has previously mentioned. Hi, thank you so much for everyone coming here. Um, so I'm Yesenia Chavez, I'm a legislative assistant for Congressman Raul Grijalva, um, who's done a lot of work on this issue, um, advocating for alternatives to detention, but specifically um, highlighting the issues that are um, targeting the LGBT immigrants that are in detention. Um, and one of the items that we have as a takeaway is to ask for you to look over the letter that um, we had passed out um, at the front table. Um, it's uh, regarding a DHS, OIG, and DOJ, OIG um, joint investigation into the sexual assault of um, women and trans folks in detention and asking for um, this investigation to be done thoroughly, which is obviously something that, as Christina mentioned, is not happening. Um, in addition, one of the things I want to highlight is that um, Congressman Grijalva in um, companionship with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders had introduced a bill um, in the last Congress called Ju the Justice is Not for Sale Act, um, which um, much like uh, the bill that Christina was referring to in California, um, is a bill to ban federal contracts with private prisons. Um, and it also ends the federal bed mandate. Um, and that is something that we are working on reintroducing soon. So look out for that in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so please take that with you. The letter may change um, as we're still going through the editing process, but I wanted to make sure you at least had a takeaway. Um, I know it's a really heavy subject, um, but I think it's really important when we can actually do something about it. So these are a couple of items that you can um, advocate internally in your offices. Um, and if you're outside, um, if there's organizations who are willing to endorse either the letter or the bill, that would be wonderful. Thank you, and I believe there is a one-pager that also has some suggested bills uh, from the Center for American Progress, so feel free to take a look at those too. Uh, thank you so much for coming out.